Hi, everybody, uh, and welcome back to the State of Marines. We have a great panel today, and I'm excited to discuss the future of the Marines in, in more detail. Uh, first, just a, just a couple of reminders, little housekeeping things um, to the right of your screen. You'll find that chat box. There you'll be able to ask our panelists questions, chat with other attendees, ask for technical assistance. Um, we will be fielding questions at the end of the program, but um, as during the during the keynote, please feel free to go on and get them in and, and we'll kind of see, I'll probably kind of seed some of them through the conversation as we go. Um, the event is being recorded and will be available on demand shortly uh, for you to share with, with anyone you'd like. Um, I'm going to turn to my turn to my panel first, and I'm going to offer everyone just a just a couple of minutes to give a little short introduction and help us sort of frame the the discussion a little bit. So, um, Kailan, I uh, I'm going to go to you first and and let you kick us off. Hi, thank you so much for having us and for having this uh, incredibly important event. Um, I am Kailan Hunter. I am a senior adjunct fellow at the Center for New American Security, a non-resident fellow at the Brute Krulak Center for Innovation and Creativity, as well as a assistant professor of military and strategic studies at the US Air Force Academy, and a Marine veteran. So I'm incredibly honored and excited to be a part of this. I think something that was incredibly important that was talked about in the beginning is this focus on recruitment and retention of a diverse force. It is a piece that we've heard a lot about um, in, the, in the news. It's been a bit contentious often in it, but I hope today we can talk a little bit about this mechanics of how we're going to do it because all of the really second half of the Commandant's remark talking about the pivots to great power competition, what it means to be a force in readiness, the acquisitions of new technologies, all of that really represents this increasingly complex environment that we are moving into. And we know that a diverse force is going to be necessary to meet those challenges, as well as knowing that the shifting demographics of this country are such that it's going to require a more creativity in who we recruit and how we recruit and train them in order to actually meet that necessary force strength that we have here or that we're going to need to, to be the force in readiness, to be that, that quick reaction force. So was really encouraged by a lot of what he was saying, but I think digging into sort of the mechanics, how this is gonna happen is something that this great panel can really do today. That's great. Um, Congressman Gallagher, I'm gonna turn to you next. Great. I think I've successfully unmuted myself after spending the last five months criticizing my uh, my <laughs> colleagues for not knowing how to operate technology. Um, Congratulations. Well, it's great to be with you. Uh, I, I love having conversations like this. Um, and I really just want to salute the Commandant for challenging my thinking and a lot of my colleagues thinking over the last few months. Uh, he's a very tough act to follow. But I think your conversation with him only further solidifies why our Marine Corps is in such good hands. Uh, one of the things I, I love most about uh, the CMC is that he knows exactly where the service needs to get and he's unafraid to wrestle with orthodoxy in order to get there. Uh, and so I, I just wanna salute him for that model of servant leadership and he's got a lot of fans here on the Hill. Uh, I wanna just briefly highlight something General Berger said. Uh, he drew a distinction between readiness and availability that I think is, is often overlooked. Uh, in other words, the Marine Corps, along with all the military services, have all of these readiness checklists about flight hours and material condition. And if there aren't enough green lights on that checklist, you're rated as being ready. But if you think about it, while this might tell one story, it doesn't really tell the crucial story, which is whether the force that we have is ready to go to war tomorrow, or as the Commandant put it, future readiness. So think about it this way. In 1939, the material readiness of the Polish cavalry was unfortunately immaterial in the balance of forces against the Wehrmacht. And if your current forces are not the right forces, they'll never be truly ready to face the current threat. So I think you can really wrap all of what the Commandant is trying to accomplish under this banner of redefining readiness. It's, it's not about how many amphibs we have or how many MUs are underway. It's a question of whether the Marine Corps is positioned in peacetime to be able to flip that switch and conduct deterrence by denial in the first island chain in particular, if the balloon were to go up. And I think everything else we do should flow from that principle. And so I'm looking forward to getting into this uh, more in the discussion 
but I think it's worth making sure everyone is on the same page uh, about the scale of this change. Quick note, uh, Chris Bros, who's been a friend for a while, has refused to do my podcast for the last three months. So I don't know what he's hiding from, but uh, Chris, I'm calling you out. Okay, well then I obviously think that I need to turn to Chris next. And um, Chris, I think you're gonna have to answer for this. Um, why have you not done the Congressman's podcast? So refusal is a strong word. Uh, <laughs> denotes a lot of intent and uh, you know deliberate thought. Um, I would probably argue laziness and uh, you know inability to respond to text effectively is probably the better uh, the better explanation. It's also um, possible that he just likes us better than you, Congressman. I'm just going to put there. I mean, you know, that's uh, that's the thought bubble over my head right now. <laughs> Um, I, uh, I, I really appreciate having the opportunity to be with all of you today. Um, uh, Chris Bros, I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Anderl Industries, a defense technology startup. Uh, I've recently written a book called The Kill Chain, focused on a lot of the questions I think we're talking about here today, you know, kind of military innovation, uh, new technologies, um, how to manage a process of change, you know, politically, operationally, and otherwise. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 as I think Congressman Gallagher said, it's a very difficult act to follow. Um, I, I guess the thing that I would underscore here uh, that, you know, that, that certainly I kind of reflect upon in the time that I've spent, you know, working on defense issues in the Congress, you know, better part of a decade on the Senate Armed Services Committee, um, and then sort of having left government, uh, you know, is the, the challenge that the Commandant has, the challenge that the Marine Corps has, and I think arguably the challenge that all the services have. Um, is that we are we are very far behind the curve in terms of the types of investments we need to be making, the types of changes we need to be making. Um, we're now in a position where we are going to have to make very difficult trade-offs about what to divest from um, at a time where the new capabilities that need to be fielded to take the position uh, of the capabilities that we're going to be laying down to sort of enable us to focus on the new problems that the Commandant is rightly calling out um, those capabilities haven't materialized just yet. Um, and this is all going to be compounded by, uh, as I believe the Commandant uh, also highlighted, the fact that we are now moving into, you know, kind of a new era of defense resource scarcity. Um, you know, the America was on a decent path to going broke before we pushed a few trillion dollars out the door for COVID response. And that's going to just exacerbate uh, the difficulty of all of these choices and trade-offs that we're going to have to make. Um, what I would say is, you know, I, I have a lot of hope here in how he's managing this because what I detect from him and his comments is, you know, he's thinking about the problem the right way. And he recognizes that uh, what we're trying to do in the future is something we haven't fully, uh, you know, kind of clearly defined yet. And we're not going to be able to clearly define it. And I think that's going to be the rub for how we manage this process of change is we don't know exactly where we're going to go. Um, we don't know exactly what technologies are going to be the best ones, what capabilities are going to be the best ones to get us there to enable the force to operate differently and solve these problems differently. Um, and I think that's an important point to underscore and just kind of hold in our minds that it's okay um, and it's to be expected. Um, we, we're in a period of uh, accelerating technological change, accelerating geopolitical change, and you know, a lot of political uncertainty and sort of fiscal constraints in America. You know, we're not going to be able to predict the future in five years uh, or in two years. Um, so the question, I think, really comes to, are we putting in place processes that allow us to learn, that allow us to experiment and feel our way to, you know, uh, God forbid, the capital R requirements that we're going to need to have the force that we're going to want uh, to solve the types of problems that the commandant is, uh, is rightly calling out. Uh, so let's focus on the problems the force has to solve. Let's empower uh, you know, Marines at every level to be creative, to be problem solvers, uh, to to sort of uh, iterate their way to the types of capabilities that are going to be successful in the future. Um, and let's also be very blunt about the fact that we're going to get it wrong. Um, we're not going to we're not going to have a perfect record of identifying the things that are going to be essential for us in the future, whether it's an operational concept, a capability, or something else. So. Uh, that, I think, is going to make all of this process of change at a sort of a political and bureaucratic level more challenging. Um, but I think it's the reality of the problem that uh, that we have to solve. Thank you. And last but not least, Valerie. Yes, thanks for having me. And uh, already uh, tough acts to follow, so I'm just really pleased and uh, humbled to be on this on this panel today. Um, Valerie Jackson, I'm the director of the Brute Krulak Center for Innovation and Creativity at Marine Corps University. 
We're a uh, civ mill think tank, and I like to say think tank and do tank. Um, that provides enhanced learning opportunities for students and faculty um, involved in PME, you know, all over the world, uh, quite literally. Um, we have a broad reach um, through a variety of channels, a lot of social media. Uh, we have a great um, non-resident fellows program of which Kylie Ann is a, a member, very active member. Um, and we really try to provide programming for students to, um, to broaden their um, innovation um, look in terms of how they view their position and time and space in the service and preparing for what their next assignment is. And that's through a lot of wargaming that we do, lecture series, um, uh, scholar programs, writing contests, those sorts of things. Uh, so it's, it's really um, what I believe is a first of its kind inside the services and I'm, I'm really privileged to, uh, to lead it. Um, I'm also a Marine reservist. And so with both hats, um, I'm very interested in the state of the Marines. I'm always interested to hear what our Commandant has to say and I'm very eager to be a part of this panel today. So thanks. Um, well, I'm going to jump right in, guys. Um, again, thank you all so much for, for being here. Um, I want to start by talking about, um, as I did with the Commandant, by talking about diversity in, in the Marine Corps on the axes of, of both gender and race. And Kylan, I'm going to let you kick us off here. Um, I, I, give us your assessment of how you think the Marine Corps is doing you know, right now in September of 2020. Where are we right now? So I, thank you for digging into this question. First of all, I think often when we talk about the state of any services, we're talking about you know, the big new equipment changes, the big strategic changes that are out there. And rightfully, we need to be thinking about these things. But first and foremost, we need to think about the people because we are still at a place where AI is not taking over the need for people to be the primary fighting force. And the Marine Corps in particular as a service is one that has always focused on the fact that they make Marines first and foremost, and every Marine has a responsibility to that. And I'd say right now, when we're sitting in 2020, we are moving in the right direction as a Marine Corps, but we are very, very far from where we need to be. And there is a lot of historical, I'm going to use the term baggage because I can't think of another better term right now, that has brought us to this point, you know, a lot of foot dragging around gender integration, for, for example. And uh, the Commandant talked a lot about facilities and structures, and that's a very real barrier. And so I think we're sitting at a place where, as a Marine Corps, from especially a gender perspective, we are at a bit of a double bind because there are strong material limitations. You know, we need to redo barracks. As he noted, on the West Coast, there are not facilities to train women Marines. And that's something that is uh, a, a fiscal challenge that's gonna have to be overcome. And so we think about how we're actually having to do these things. It's not just enough to kind of wave the wand and say, oh yep, we can now, we're now going to integrate platoons. There's a cost. And what does that cost come at? Which is one of the big like discussions that needs to be going on is that, yes, we might be taking money from some other programs, but if we're not recruiting and retaining women right now, we're going to suffer 20, 30, 40 years into the future, especially if you look at the data coming out of jammers that in the next 30 years, the eligible population of white men to actually join the military is going to be drastically decreasing. Um, and this isn't really the forum to talk about all those reasons why, but it sets a very real picture that to meet force strength, we need to recruit women uh, first and foremost, and those facilities have to be prioritized. But then the cultural side of this is also incredibly important. And that in addition to recruiting women, we need to retain women into these leadership positions at every schoolhouse so that every male Marine who shows up is used to seeing a woman in a position of power and that's fine, it just becomes normalized. And the same there with people of color. You know, the Commandant noted that there was a you know, sort of lack in the pipeline, that that's one of the things we need more people of color, more women in the leadership pipeline where the Marine Corps is a war fighting force first and foremost. So senior leadership is going to come from war fighting MOSs. And I would argue that's also rightfully where it should be. But what are we doing to empower young women, young people of color when they show up at recruit training, officer candidate school, at the academies, at uh, ROTC programs to see the Marine Corps as a viable career for them? 
because one of the things that isn't often talked about, and this is especially true with people of color who come in, is that they choose career fields that have a direct correlation to outside employment and see the military to include the Marine Corps as a stepping stone to civilian employment. So logisticians, mechanics, you know, very vital support functions, but that have a direct correlation to your outside employment. You know, being an infantryman or an infantry officer doesn't have much of a civilian you know, context here. And so how do we, we really change the conversation to have these people see that, no, you have a career here. You have a home here for the longevity of, of your career. And this is the way that you actually succeed. Exceed. Yeah, succeed. Um, so those mentors at that young age talking about what career paths look like, but then also something we didn't talk about too much in, in the Commodore outside is what are the support structures we're putting in place to allow for women and ethnic minorities to achieve those roles. You know, um, maternity leave, um, which I actually say should be parental leave, childcare, other things that Commodore has really rightfully talked about. Because if we're looking at women and people of color, you have more likely to be single parents um, in that regard than white men are. Um, more likely to, if they're not single parents, be in dual working couple relationships. So in addition to that mentorship and seeing it as a career, how are we also providing those structures so that these individuals that we want to achieve leadership positions aren't forced into the position of saying, do I, go take care of my kids, or do I pursue an important leadership career in the Marine Corps? And so I'd, I'd really, you know, for, for Congress as they're looking at where they're gonna, you know, push and appropriate uh, money, thinking that these support structures aren't just these sort of nice to have social justice issues that they way too often get framed at. They are the critical pieces to ensuring that the Marine Corps continues wow. to be able to recruit and retain the most qualified people to maintain their status as this premier force and readiness that we have uh, really in the globe right now. I, I was going to turn to to Mr. Gallagher next on on exactly that point. Number one, you know, obviously the the commandant raised the issue of like, look, you know, we need we need money for facilities. You know, is that something that um, that that Congress is sort of thinking about? And then also, um, you know, beyond that. Um, it took an act of Congress to to get the Marines to to sort of think about integrating women at the at the platoon level. I, do you anticipate Congress will seek to intervene again to address diversity issues directly within the Marines, and and should it? Well, in some ways, I, I've always felt that the Marine Corps represents um, what's best in our society. At least in my own experience, when I was downrange, it didn't matter who you were, where you're from what your religion was or what your skin color was. Uh, everyone was a Marine and we all, you know, relied on each other. It was an incredibly unifying experience. My own unit on my first deployment, I think I had a, a black radio operator. My uh, intelligence analyst was Hispanic. My half my collectors were white. The other half were from all different racial backgrounds. And so I do think the Marine Corps is a unique unifying experience uh, where, you know, being a Marine transcends your socioeconomic um, or, or other forms of your background. Um, at the same time, I think the Commandant's right to suggest that even the Marine Corps is not perfect. We've only had 25 African Americans make it to 07 or above. Uh, none have been awarded their fourth star. Clearly, there's room to do better, and I think Congress should look at how we, we do better. Uh, I'm not certain I've seen a proposal out there that would be perfect, but I'm glad the Commandant led the way in removing Confederate paraphernalia from our bases, uh, even before the tragic death of George Floyd. I'm hopeful that his leadership sets a tone that makes clear all Americans who can cut out, who are cut out to be a Marine and can make it uh, are welcome. Um, if there's something that concerns me, it's that the Marine Corps is downstream of bigger problems uh, in our society. I mean, you look at my own state, educational outcomes in our K through 12 system are abysmal uh, for all of our kids, uh, but particularly for uh, black and Hispanic kids uh, in, in Wisconsin. Uh, it is, it, it's, it's unacceptable. Uh, and we're increasingly moving to a, a situation where uh, if you have 60% of kids uh, in a state that, that can't read at grade level uh, and an enormous plurality of kids that are overweight and obese, what chance do they have of, of being able to join the Marine Corps uh, if they're white, black, Asian, whatever? Uh, so I think there's, there's bigger problems that are upstream of this that politicians of both parties 
need to take a look at. And a lot of them are educational problems. Um, Valerie, I've got one more on, on, on this sort of bucket, and then I think I'm going to um, I'm going to sort of take us on to some questions about the planning guidance. But, um, you know, General Berger has said publicly, and he sort of addressed this today, that, you know, one of the problems that they're facing is folks that are taking themselves out of the command screening boards at a much higher rate than than white men. Um, you know, what what is your understanding sort of from the sort of from the education and the mentorship side right now about why that's happening and, and what can the core do to, to address it? Um, well, th thanks for the question. Um, you know, I, I think what's what's really powerful, what I've seen, uh, and, and what I've seen, frankly, is the difference between you know when I uh, was first in the Marine Corps uh, back in the 1900s, uh, and then and then now, and what I see in the student population is actually quite reassuring. Um, where there used to be, uh, and, and I was part of this myself, you know, a big effort to blend in. And you know, not be different, and just you know, be just be a marine. I just wanted to be a marine. Um, where now there is an active um, seeking out, if you will, uh, inside of the schools and programs of, of female marines that are look are looking for mentorship from both men and women, and actively seeking that out and saying, I you know, I realize you know my situation is different than her situation than his situation and you know how can i make this work because i want to stay and what's also helpful is that now they see the example um for for those that are you know my age and, and probably older you know we the old expression of you can't be it if you can't see it i mean we just simply did not have the example of how it was possible to have a career uh, early on and so, and so now we have that. So as the Marine Corps has really changed some policies in a very positive way, uh, there are more opportunities for, for women that I can speak of, you know, that to, to advance. And, and educationally, um, during that time that we have them in a resident program, there's really that opportunity to explore either through personal relationships or through um, their, you know, writing of a master thesis or involvement in um, extracurricular activities of, of those sorts of things. So it's really encouraging. Let's let's turn to um, a sort of more nuts and bolts discussion of, of the planning guidance and the force redesign and what that means for the core going forward, sort of both organizationally and, and in terms of, of implementation. Um, Chris, you know, you've you've written the proverbial book on the ways that Eisenhower's original conception of a military industrial congressional complex um, created institute has created some institutional barriers to the US's ability to kind of prepare for the next war. Um, but of course, General Berger's planning guidance looks for some of the kinds of radical changes that you've advocated for. And you, you know, you you alluded to this a little bit in your opening statement. You know, how does he execute it? Like talk to us a little bit about the challenges that you foresee that he's gonna have to navigate to turn this vision into reality. Yeah, it's um yeah, I, I think the problem as you as you sort of framed it is right. You know, we have a, a defense system or a defense establishment uh, that is not just the military. Uh, it is the Department of Defense. It is the Congress, both bodies, both parties. Um, it's defense industry and all of its flavors and shapes. And then all manner of other kind of external groups, you know, retired general officers and people who have uh, vested interests in the way things are, the way things could be. Um, it's a very closed system. It's become a more consolidated system. Um, there's a tendency in that system to sort of drink your own bathwater. Um, so I think the challenge for him is, you know, again, how do you how do you chart a path to a future and realign the incentives? Um, we didn't just end up in a, you know, I think the predicament or the problem that we're in by accident. Um, it's not because the people working in our defense establishment aren't patriotic or aren't smart or hardworking. Um, it's the incentives that have been created over many years uh, to consistently think the same way, produce the same things, rely upon the same things, and define progress and change as kind of the incremental improvements on things that we've always had and have relied upon, uh, you know, to deliver real military advantage for a very long period of time. Um, bureaucracy by its nature is not designed to change. It's designed to slow change that could be detrimental to the nation or the force. So I think for him, the challenge is going to be, how do you begin to realign those incentives? Um, what parts of it does he control? Um, and I think the things that he can you know, most immediately impact are defining the problem in a way that people understand what he's talking about. So boiling that force planning guidance down to the specific operational problems that Marines are gonna have to be able to solve in a great power competition type scenario. Um, 
beginning to think, you know, about change more incrementally. You know, we all want change to be kind of the big bang, the big epiphany, um, you know, and, and that's just not how it's going to happen. You know, it's going to happen sort of systematically, incrementally, year by year. Um, but, you know, unless we can do those small things well, unless we can kind of learn from the experiments we're doing and sort of scale, uh, you know, we're not going to actually get to the places that I think he wants us to, uh, to be in. And I think that's how you manage the sort of political and bureaucratic uh, impediments or reluctance uh, that you're, you're already starting to see in some places and that you, you will likely see in the future as those choices get harder, um, which is people, you know, there's, a, there's an element of, you know, you have to see it to believe it. Um, you know, people are always reluctant to have a tool taken away from them uh, when you can't sort of hand them a, a better capability at the same time. Um, the way we're going to have to manage this, I think, is, you know, sort of uh, making those investments in the future force and incrementally, year after year, program after program, sort of seeding them in and pushing them out and fielding them uh, at the same time that you can begin to sort of dial back uh, divestments in a way that, you know, soften the blow, uh, sort of manage the losers in that process in a way that politically we're going to have to. Uh, so it's gonna be a, a complex and difficult process that he's going to have to manage. Um, what I would say, you know, just as a, as a final point, um, you know, I agree with everything that has been said about diversity, uh, you know, to, to date on this panel. The other element that I'd throw in here uh, has to do with age. And you know what I found in, in working with Marines and talking to Marines is that younger Marines are very excited about this. Um, they know this is where uh, the Marine Corps has to go. They're very supportive of this. Um, I think one of the core challenges he's going to have is really empowering the force at the younger level to, to help him sort of define and drive the types of changes that he's talking about um, and really putting those types of uh, folks in a position where they can help guide the future development of the force. I, just as a as a follow up there, Chris, to sort of wait um, the your your points about the um, the commandant's proposal, like is he sort of getting this sold and putting it into fruition? Is he is he raising the clock here at all? I mean, in other words, does he have enough institutional support to get this model kind of indelibly enshrined before his time as commandant is up? And you know, or like, do you think we're on this path now? Um, I, I, he's been racing the clock since the day he got into the seat. And you know that's the challenge of a, of a job like this. Um, you know I think you can think of change at certain levels, and you know what what I think he's trying to do is sort of affect it at the molecular level, so that this is the type of change that outlives him. You know it's not sort of a fad or a flash in the pan that you know when he leaves, a cult of personality departs, and everything just basically kind of snaps back to the way that it was. Um, I think that he's actually driving the agenda at an intellectual level that that is changing people's thinking. And I do think that he's winning the argument in that regard. I think it's very difficult to try to argue that the way we have been doing things and the things we've been using to do them are going to succeed for us in the future. Um, simply by framing the problem that way, I think you're, you're now sort of forcing people to fight on your terms. Um, and and that's, a, that's, gonna, that's gonna be an argument. You know, that is going to be a fight. And, and I think he welcomes that. So, um, you know, but I think simply the fact that we're now having the conversation inside the terms of the debate that he's largely defined, um, I think is a, is a representation of the success that he's had already. Um, no one is arguing that, you know, the focus is off. It, you know, I think we're talking more about, you know, are we making the right choices? How do we do this? Which, you know, to me is an indication that the debate has shifted. Um, but, you know, the, the hard part is going to be in the execution and the implementation. I, Congressman Gallagher, you know, you're, you're on the Hill, you know, you're watching the response to, to this proposal from your, from your colleagues, you know, obviously he had described to me today that, oh, the response has been, has been great, you know, there's been pushback on some things, but it's helped us make the plan better. Um, you know, he essentially painted a, a, a picture of, you know, lawmakers who were saying, yep, we're on board, this is a great idea. Is that, was that an accurate characterization sort of from, from the seat that you sit in? And, and I think most importantly, do you think that your colleagues are you know, prepared to make some of those hard decisions when it comes to divesting sort of some of these legacy capabilities, particularly if, for example, it's built in their district? Well, I think the statement is accurate. The reception has been very positive and the comment on his team have done a great job of reaching out to us proactively, explaining the logic behind his planning guidance and the associated documents. Uh, but I think it's also fair to say that Congress has not yet been tested uh, in a meaningful way as to whether it's interested in implementing uh, or bringing to life the planning guidance. Uh, I think we've had significant 
hiccups in implementing the overall national defense strategy. I, I would challenge anyone to show me whether we have a single asset in Indo-PACOM today that wasn't there prior to the NDS and the NSS. And I think all of this presumes, and I really, I mean, Chris's book is the best source to go to, to, to think about this stuff. It really is an exceptional accomplishment. I'm not allowed to officially promote it, but I'm, I think I can say it's good. Um, the conversation that's never really happened, and, and maybe this is going to sound silly, but I, I just keep coming back to this, is we have all these hearings, members say things, the cameras are there, but we've never, without cameras rolling, just sat in a room with the commandant, the SECNAV, whoever else needs to be in that room, and like the five members of Congress who actually pay attention to this stuff, and had a map on the table, and had someone explain to us in actual simple and direct English prose, not Pentagon acronym doublespeak. Here's what the Chinese or uh, Communist Party is trying to do. Here's what we need in order to prevent them from doing that thing. And here's just how it all works together. And here's what we think our allies can contribute to that deterrence by denial strategy. Maybe that conversation has happened without me. Uh, but I don't think it's actually happened ever. And until we have that shared understanding of what we're trying to do in the first island chain, I'm just not sure Congress is going to be able to make those hard decisions. You know, you're going to have Gallagher talking about small surface combatants. You'll have Whitman talking about carriers. You'll have Courtney talking about Columbia class subs. Uh, but we need it all to kind of work together in terms of a shared theory of victory for what we're trying to do. So regardless of who wins the election, or who's SECDEF in January 2020, the first thing we should do is like a, a CODEL to Newport or even at 8th and I and have that conversation so we can all get on the same page. What about, and then and, and sort of as a follow on to that, I mean, uh, you know, what uh, it, sound, well, it sounds like, first of all, it sounds like what you were describing is in fact a one of the failures of communication that the commandant sort of alluded to in his, his keynote. He said, you know, look, when we don't get, when we don't get by and when we don't, you know, the, when, when I see, when I see sort of pitfalls to, to making this come, to making this plan become reality, it's because we haven't communicated sort of effectively enough with our various stakeholders, including Congress. You know, is this sort of, is what you're describing um, another sort of failure of a deeply partisan and divided Congress right now? Or is it, you know, is it that the Pentagon is not sort of offering you guys the information that you need to, to make some of these hard decisions? Well, I think it's, you know, there's a certain way things have, have always been done. Uh, there's a certain amount of deference or resilience to the status quo that's very difficult to overcome. And uh, there's been a failure to think about how we have a better process uh, for Congress engaging with DOD so we can avoid just having the appropriators, you know, outsource their thinking to industry. And then we get more of the same, which is kind of what Chris's book talks about. I would think it's fair to say, though, that even if the commandant is extraordinarily effective in implementing his vision, there are higher order questions that need to be resolved about uh, the Navy and, and the Navy's budget relative to the other branches that can only be resolved really at the White House level uh, in consultation with Congress that have yet to be resolved right now. Yeah, I, I want to open this one up to kind of whoever wants to to address um, address this because obviously, I, Congressman Gallagher, it's your proposal that you know, look, we need to basically pull the Navy and the Marine Corps' budget and um, budgetary offices and stick them under the authority of the SecNav and have them be together. I'd love to open that up to sort of whoever would like to respond to good idea to that proposal. Good idea, bad idea. I mean, is that the right direction that we're heading in? I'm going to kind of look for who wants to wave their hand at me. <laughs> Brilliant idea. It's a genius idea. Whoever came up with that is a, a <laughs> real. Re-elected <laughs> Otherwise, I'm gonna pick somebody for the hot seat. So I'll I'll go ahead and and, and jump in. I'll I'll just say that I you know interesting. I'd like to to see more detail on that. What that actually would look like, and address what the commandant um, mentioned in terms of personalities. So. That would be great as long as you had a SECNAV that was, you know, uh, understood the, the equal importance of each service and, you know, and the emphasis that needed to be placed in certain programs over others. Um, but what if you, what if you have a, a force of personality in there that, um, you know, leans heavily one way or the other, or is completely new to, to DOD? Um, 
in, you know, and, and doesn't have a full comprehension of what actually needs to happen inside each service. So I'd need to see more detail, I guess, is where I'm, I'm going with that. But um, I think, uh, you know, it's certainly worth exploring because this is, this is definitely a time for, uh, for change. And um, maybe that's something that we, we need to look at, but uh, there would need to be some very um, specific uh, details in there that would, you know, make me sort of throw my weight behind, yet this is a, a great decision, so. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to echo that and I think take a little bit more, you know, with the, the force of personality being a big part. And also I think some concerns about the potential for over politicization of the budgets where, you know, there, there clearly needs to be a sort of renewal of how we do things, but, you know, as, as much as possible, and this even I think feeds into some things the Commandant we're talking about, about being apolitical, that the, the budgets and really what we are investing in, in our services should be 100% determined by that analysis on future threats and how we are going to be not just ready, as in all of our aircraft are up, but prepared to fight the wars that are coming. And uh, I think my, my biggest concern coming of it is that putting everything under, under SECNAV, like not only do you have somebody who may be completely new to the DOD, who doesn't have that sort of long institutional knowledge of not just how war fighting is done, but where the threats are coming from and how the services really fit together to meet those threats. But you know, there's a there's a potential, I think, for a, a politicization of that and the budgets more than we're seeing combining them. And I think that's something that if, you know, to, to Val's point here, if we can get a little more detail, see how that would be worked out to ensure more coordination and, and uh, cooperation between the budgets, because having a Navy and Marine Corps competitive budget process can definitely be antithetical to especially the Commandant's new um, force design and, and planning guidance that really is this return to the naval force and readiness, but needing to make sure that that stays 100% focused on threats and capabilities and doesn't like even have the potential of being appearing to be overly partisan or politicized is something I'd want to make sure was very cautioned against. And yeah, and Kylan, I'd love to sort of follow up on that. You know, one of the um, sort of relatedly, one of the criticisms of the planning guidance has been that that this is going to make the Marine Corps sort of subordinate to the to the needs of the to the needs of the Navy in ways that might be damaging to the to the very culture of the Corps. Like, is is that a fair criticism? I, I think it's a, it's a fair speculative criticism. It's something that we're we're left to see. And I think there's with the Marine Corps there's always historically been this tension of we're part of the Department of the Navy. We come from the sea, we fight from the sea. Like that's, that's the, if you think about the whole need for a force and readiness, you know, that's how we, you know, pre-positioned uh, force and readiness, that's how we get there. The majority of the population still living near the littorals. That's where conflict is happening. Like that, that's still a very real reality. And so coming from the sea is important, but it is, it, it does potentially inextricably tie the Marine Corps and Marine Corps capabilities to what the Navy actually decides to do. And so I, I think having a more cooperative process is absolutely important, but subordination is something that needs, I think it's an important flag to be waved. You know, I don't think it necessarily is saying we're going to be subordinate, but this is a very important flag that, um, is to be waived. And I, I think the Commandant is a person who encourages these detractors and encourages criticism to ensure that we continue to move forward and say, you know, we know that we need to return to fight from the sea because that's a deficiency that has existed because for the past 20 years, we've been focused on the sandbox. And we have lost this core competency um, of being an actual naval force and readiness prepared to respond to crises in the littorals like that's just something that we've we haven't practiced it's not it's not something that we did a lot of you know when when i came into the marine corps back in the day yeah we we did learn ship stuff um by the time i left the pilots that were coming in after me never had to land on the boat it's not something that it's even just a core skill they didn't have to learn how to do because everyone was heading straight to Iraq or Afghanistan. And so they waived those sort of requirements. And so it's an important reshift in focus, but while we're doing it, I think it's absolutely important that it is done in a way that doesn't tie the hands of what the capabilities are based on naval budgets. Right. 
I'm going to kind of open this one up to to the floor as well. Um, you know, when kind of while we're staying in this space, you know, when, when people first started talking about General Berger's planning guidance, one of the things that you heard a lot was that it was going to present some challenges and maybe force some changes in other service branches. Um, so kind of what the interplay in between, you know, in between the other branches has been as a result of, um, of this guidance. And I'm curious if anybody on the panel thinks that we have seen that happen or if it's too, too soon to tell, you know, what is this sort of done to sort of how DOD broadly and how the other service branches are kind of thinking about and preparing for a potential conflict with, with China? Yeah, I mean, I'll take a stab. Um, I think it's hard to read, uh, you know, General CQ Brown's uh, recent document, you know, Accelerate Change or Lose, and, and not sort of see echoes of the Commandant sentiment in that. You know, I think his planning guidance really set, uh, set a high bar for the other service chiefs and others in the department to say, you know, here's someone who's wrestling with the problem honestly, um, who, who sees us, you know, for what we are in terms of how far behind uh, we actually are in terms of the changes we need to make. Um, and is moving with a sense of urgency to define the problem and accept that hard changes with real trade-offs are going to have to be made. Um, you know, I think that you you see the other services sort of responding as uh, you know kind of in kind, um, and I think that's great. Um, I think that's exactly how it should be. I mean, I think the bigger questions are sort of echoing back. You know, what we were just talking about is um, the challenge that we have right now when we think about how we get ready for great power competition, how we are going to think about you know, joint war fighting in the future, um, you know, is that we're, we're talking about the sort of arbitrary ways that we have sort of traditionally divided ourselves, um, very geographic, uh, sort of domain centric uh, military services uh, at a time when all of the rage is joint all domain command and control. Um, you know, so going back to the conversation around sort of Navy Marine Corps, um, I personally really don't care, uh, you know, where the money ends up going. We need to ask the question in a different way in the sense of, I need to be able to detect threats. I don't care whether it's Marines on a beach or ships at sea or undersea, manned or unmanned, large or small, you know, I need to be able to find the adversary. Um, I need to be able to track it. I need to be able to, you know, enable a human being to make a decision. Um, and I need to be able to call in fires again, whether it's coming from, you know, Marines on a basketball court somewhere inside the, you know, the envelope or, uh, you know, a very large traditional combatant uh, at sea, it doesn't matter. Um, what is going to ultimately be more effective? You know, what's going to enable us to act faster at larger scales, um, you know, from the standpoint of connecting sensors to shooters and enabling human decision making? Um, I think if we've, we've got to ask the question and sort of answer the question that way. Um, as a way of then sort of let the the force planning fall out of that rather than, uh, you know, sort of think through, uh, you know, how we're going to do the sort of traditional divisions that we've always relied upon either between the Navy and the Marine Corps or across the services in the department where, you know, everyone's focused on their share of the budget uh, and we all want to be very respectful so everyone gets an equal share. Um, you know, that that's just not going to work in the future. It's not going to be the way we solve this problem and it's it's sort of a dishonest approach to the problem to begin with. Um, can I just try yeah. and say I emphatically agree with all of that? Um, and if I could just defend my proposal that I, I thought no one had paid attention to. I'm not sure I was attacking uh, it. I, uh... Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. But the, the prior, prior, uh, let's say tepid responses to my proposal. Chris, uh, <laughs> you've never been loath to attack me. Um, I mean, if, the, if, if to Chris's point, like if the Navy and the Marine Corps can't answer that question, about here's how we're going to do the things we need to do, at least in the most important theater geopolitically, then the services aren't going to be able to answer that question more broadly. And right now, we I think we have certain things that don't necessarily work well together. Like, I mean, we're increasing the size of the army, and then we're, we're struggling to come up with shipbuilding dollars. And all of that just gets back to this basic conversation that's that's never happened. I think Perhaps what's forcing the other services to think this way, in addition to the Commandant's example of leadership, is just a recognition of something we talked about before, which is that budgetary constraints are going to grow over the next decade. I mean, we're heading into the terrible 20s. And so, you know, as the old saying goes, now that we've run out of money, it's time to start thinking. Um, so we're in the early stages of that thought process, but it's one that needs to happen. 
is there anybody else that wants to add anything to sort of this kind of bucket they're in? Because we have about five minutes left and, and I'm going to move us on to a wildly different topic. <laughs> but I want to make sure everybody has sort of had a chance to, to respond. Okay, speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> um, like I said, we have about five minutes left. And so I, I wanna um, I wanna close by talking a little bit about um, the sort of civ mill issues as it as it relates to the to the Marines specifically. You know, I asked General Berger, um, you know, this morning, like, what do you sort of anticipate, what do you expect from your retired general officers um, when it comes to public speech after they have left the service? And obviously, I'm, I'm thinking in, in particular of some of the prominent Marine general officers that we have seen speak out against a, a sitting president and his policies as it relates to the handling of the, as it relates to the handling of the protests um, over the death of George Floyd that we saw this summer. Um, and so I kind of want to go down the line a little bit um, and just get you sort of each briefly to give me a sense of, you know, what your expectation of, what your understanding of where the line is. You know, what kind of speech um, do we either expect, tolerate, or, um, or, or encourage from, from retired general officers once they have left the Marines? Um, and so, Kylan, I'm going to start with you and just work down the line in the same order I've been going. <laughs> sorry, you are in the hot seat every time. Put the salt first all the time here. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm sorry. I like to be consistent. Super, I just want to make sure. Super non-controversial conversation, too, that I get to I go know. first. I, the record on. <laughs> Love I know you can handle it. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, this, I think, first is just, it's such an important conversation that we, we continue to have. And I think I, I want to sort of blow the lens back even more around you know, what's, what are the expectations of retired general officers and just start there before we even get into some of the specific comments, because in addition to, you know, comments about a sitting pre president, there's also been a lot of discussion, controversy, whatever you want to say it in the, in the fold around how quickly retired general officers go onto boards of defense contractors, which has, you know, influence into political decision-making, how quickly, retired general officers go into um, administrative administration positions as political appointees. And so I think this big conversation, you know, in uniform, we always talk about being apolitical. And if we're going to allow, and I'm gonna use that term like an air quotes, you know, accept general officers going on to boards of contractors that Congress is making decisions about awarding very big contracts to, if we're going to allow them to go into administrative, politically appointed positions that are political and partisan in nature, then I think we that reflects on the service just as much as speech that's criticizing a sitting president. And so I think that if we're gonna say, don't criticize, we say, once you take the uniform off, you don't do anything that could be in the public realm. Or we say, you're a private citizen and you do, you do what you wanna do. We need to accept these things together and not really cherry pick what we either like or don't like as, as part of that conversation. That's great. Mr. Gallagher? Well, maybe I'll preface this by acknowledging that I'm a former Marine Corps officer now serving in Congress. Uh, and I've worked to recruit more of my fellow veterans to join me. So there might be an element of hypocrisy here, but I think the promise of having more young veterans on both sides of the aisle serving Congress is that you'd like to think we can sit across from the generals uh, and the admirals uh, in hearing and understand what they're saying, but also have the experience and knowledge uh, to push back. Because I think there is a sort of reflexive deference to anybody that has some stars on their shoulders, that's that's unhealthy when it comes to uh, oversight. And it's unhealthy for the people that have uh, those stars on their shoulders, which is why it's so welcoming or uh, encouraging when you have someone like the Commandant inviting criticism and debate. And to any retired general who uh, is thinking about speaking at a convention, um, listen, if you want to run for office, go for it. You know, you're, you're a you're, you're an American. You can you can say whatever the heck you want, but just don't allow yourself to be used by by politicians uh, in both parties. You just want to get reelected. Uh, it's not actually you know about uh, listening to your ideas. So maybe that's a bit cynical or a bit harsh, but um, I don't know. I, I think there are real risks to what we're doing from a civil mill perspective. Chris. Yeah. So I just would say briefly. I mean, I think echoing that. Um, you know, I, I think we also need to be cognizant. Uh, of the expectations that we put on retired military leaders um, 
too often, I think they're held up to be, you know, saviors, um, that they're the ones who are going to save us from our political choices or our political leaders or our civilian leaders. Uh, you know, of course they carry, uh, you know, kind of a, a special kind of authority or legitimacy by virtue of what they've done, the service they've rendered, uh, the places they've lived and worked. Um, I think we just need to be a little more cognizant of the fact that, uh, you know, if we're, if we're, if we're concerned about, you know, political or, mil you know, the, the politicization of the military uh, and sort of military leaders engaging on political matters, we should be a little more reluctant to, you know, continue demanding them to do it. Um, I think that's something we need to turn the knife on ourselves on and, and recognize that uh, you, you, you do not have to have served in uniform uh, to have critical thoughts of the United States military. Uh, you do not have to have served in uniform in order to have unique legitimacy to say things that are critical uh, you know, of our political system, of our political leaders to criticize you know, those in power. Um, we need to, to I think, stop you know, as civilians, and I say this as a civilian never having served, um, we need to be uh, more reluctant uh, to sort of immediately assume that the military is somehow going to save us from choices that are inherently national and political in nature. Hey, Valerie, bring us home. <laughs> yeah, great, thanks. Um, and, and, you know, I was really gratified to hear the Commandant speak the way he did, because for those of us that are still involved, I mean, and, and, and actively serving, you know, it's, it's uncomfortable quite honestly, you know, when you, you see how someone or someone's thoughts can be politicized, you know, one way or the other, because, you know, we do, we sign up, we, we swear to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. And it's not about a political party. It's not about an individual, you know, sitting president or members of Congress. It is always, has been and always will be about the Constitution. And I think as long as we keep the focus on that, um, you know, and we look at, at some of these folks with a little bit of compassion too. You know, they they've served their countries for decades um, in in all cases, uh, and and they want to continue to be uh, useful and part of the solution to whatever problem they may see um, in front of them. And so, you know, they they are allowed to have thoughts and they're allowed to do things that are outside of you know a military scope. Um, so I, I'm not saying that we need to, you know, give them a break and treat them with with kid gloves, but I think we have to be realistic that these are human beings and not infallible, right? Um, but at the same time, I think it's incumbent upon them to understand that no matter, you know, what they decide to do post-military, they will always be viewed, especially Marines, you know, as a Marine general. Once a Marine, always Marine was never more true for our general officers. And so no matter what they say or do, the American people will always, uh, you know, see them as the general. Um, and so they, they just have to be cognizant of that. And I think, you know, if we, we combine that um, with a little bit of reality that, you know, these are, these are men and women that, um, that have a great deal to offer still. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe not put them in a position to where they're going to be exploited as well. You know, it, it's a, it's going to be a partnership moving forward. But, you know, I, I think remaining apolitical as much as possible um, and, and, you know, just recognizing that there's a lot of utility there and that, that operational experience and perspective is vital, uh, is vital to have that as part of the conversation, maybe not leading the conversation or directing the conversation, but at least part of it. So, you know, I, I'm, again, I was reassured by what he said and I, and I hope that he can, um, you know, that, that word spreads. Well, thank you so much for, for all of your, your thoughtful insights on, on that and everything else that we have covered today. We've covered a lot of territory. <laughs> um, that is uh, unfortunately all we have, have time for today. Um, I wanna thank all of you, Kylian, Valerie, Chris, Congressman Gallagher, thank you so much for, for joining us and, and for, for, for being such a thoughtful participants in, in the conversation. And, and thank you to our audience for, for tuning in. Um, for those of you watching at home, be sure to register and, and join us on October 1st at, at 3 p.m. Uh, that's Eastern for our next event in the series, the State of the Space Force, which is going to feature a keynote interview with Lieutenant General David Thompson, the Vice Commander of the US Space Force. Um, and that's it for from us today. So thank you so much uh, to everyone for joining us and have a great afternoon. <laughs>